we're looking at Parshat Korach. Um, <clears throat> it's very hard for me, but it's too late, so I'm not going to, I was going to go into the whole Machloket, Korach, and, uh, and the people, um, and, and see with you what, that there, this is a Machloket, a, um, a, uh, a popular uprising in which various factions with different access to grudge against Moshe and Aaron, uh, and they all uh, bring their, their own arguments uh, to, in the face of Moshe. Uh, but instead of looking at those, because as I said, I've really, I'm, I'm, um, well, do you know what? I can teach later. I hope that you can stay later. Um, we're just going to go st straight into Moshe's reaction, thing, which has reverberated through the generations. Um, and I want to hone in on uh, Pasuk. Um, where is it? Just before here. Um, no, why can't I find it? The time of Guram. Okay, I am not finding it. Oh, that's because I put the I put the relevant book in before. Okay, I changed the order of the parasha. <laughs> okay, the first uh, the first paragraph on the on your page starts from Pasuk Kaf Gimel, and the beginning of the parasha is the second paragraph, which is why I got lost. Um, and when Moshe is finally has had it with all the different arguments. He turns around to Am Yisrael and he says, "Vayom pasuk kafchet, vayom Moshe bezot teidun ki Hashem shlachi lo milibi." This is how you'll know that God has sent me, and I haven't made it all up. Ki im kemot kol haadun haadam yimutun ele ufku kudat kol haadam yipaked alehem. If these people, if these rebels, die as any other person would die, then God has not sent me. But, But if God makes a new creation and the earth opens up its mouth and swallows them and all of their belongings, and all who can, who are connected, and they go down alive to the grave, then you'll know that these people have provoked God. Okay, what do I want to look at? I want to look at Moshe's Te'ana. Kilomilibi. Don't think that everything I've said, everything I've done, everything I've given you is milibi, is my own invention and not from God. That was never one of their claims. Korach said, Kol ha'eda kulam kudoshim betoch Hashem, betoch Hashem madu betiknes u'al kehal Hashem. People are holy, all the people can prophesy. Why should you be, have made yourselves greater than anybody else? In other words, it's a, a, a leadership challenge. And Datan and Abiram say, Uh, 
Why have you brought us into the wilderness? You haven't fulfilled your promise. You haven't brought us to a land. You want new, new people to be in charge. Nobody has mentioned the possibility that things which Moshe has been presenting as the word of God. Yes, Lecha, thank you know, your voice is going on and off. It's not, I can't hear anything. Oh. You know, it's on and then the sentence, you continue the sentence and then it picks up again on my computer. Is there any problem? Check your internet okay, connection. Maybe, maybe Sarah Jo, check internet your internet connection. connection. Sometimes the internet That's makes fine. the voice I'm go in and out. I'm checking my internet connection. I think it's saying it's going to tell me it's unstable. Um, Um, internet connection. Yeah. I, I cannot see the internet connection. Look on the bottom of your screen, the bottom of your computer screen. You should have a little icon. Yeah, um, I'm looking. It looks okay. It looks okay. Connected, secured, looks okay. Okay. Okay, let's try again then. Hopefully, it'll be okay. Otherwise, uh, maybe we'll see uh, what you Okay, if it gets bad, I will switch to turn on another computer to make sure that I can do that if I have to. So nobody, has, is this, you're still hearing? Okay, to say, we doubt that what you've said is the word of God. Moshe also comes up with other uh, cl claim that he, as if people have made this claim against him, when he says, um, Uh, a little bit further down. Um, I, when he said that he hasn't taken anything which doesn't belong for, to him from anybody. Where is that? Um, Yeah, uh, in Pasuk Tetvah, when after Datan and Aviram speak to Moshe, he's very angry. I didn't take anybody's donkey, and I didn't do anything bad to any of them. They have nothing. Nothing to say against me. But again, these are not claims that any of, of uh, Datan and Abiram have brought against Moshe. It's almost as if Moshe is taking all the natural claims, which all the natural uh, accusations that could be brought against him and throwing them all together here into the, the, the pot of angry accusations. that Korach himself, uh, followers, Datan and Abiram, who are from the tribe of Ruven, are all bringing together. And into that pot of accusations, he also says, and you know what? I didn't steal anything from anyone, certainly didn't misrepresent the word of God. Now it's telling me my internet connection is unstable. Okay, has, has everyone lost me or can you still hear? Uh, everyone's I muted, so you can't you. tell me. I will unmute. You can still hear me. Okay. So if you stop hearing me, tell me. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. I, I want to go now. I'm going to share the next part of the sheet. Um, 
because I want to go into this question of whose words is Moshe, is, is the Torah? Is it Moshe's words or is it God's words? And, uh, and see how profound how profoundly important that is throughout Jewish history. So we started with this, this pasuk. Moshe's greatest uh, um, challenge to his leadership as the question which nobody has asked. This is how you'll know that God sent me and that everything I've done is his word and his command mine. And uh, the Mishnah in Masechet Sanhedrin, uh, thousands of years later, right? Uh, 3, 000, over 3,000 years later, discusses what kind of accusation, what kind of rebellion should make someone undeserving of being a part of Am Yisrael. And they ask the question in the, the, uh, uh, the Mishnah, uh, presents the question as a question, who doesn't deserve to be part of Am Yisrael, not when, as we judge them, but as God judges us. Kol Yisrael, There is a world to come. All of Am Yisrael have a portion in it. Shne'emar in Yishayahu ve'amech kulam tzadikim le'olam yirshu aretz. All your people are righteous. Le'olam in the, the, the missionary is interpreting le'olam as olam haba yirshu aretz. In the future they'll inherit the earth. The elu These are the people who don't have a chelek in, in, the, in the next, in, who, are, who are excluded from that. Ha'omer, en tchiyat ha-metim, ve'en Torah min ha-shamayim, ve'epikorus. And the, 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 the next mission, another couple of examples, but these are the examples which relate to things you believe. Ha'omer, en tchiyat ha-metim, somebody who says, Who doesn't, who, who doesn't believe that the dead will be revived. Tchiyat HaMetim is not the same as Olam Haba, as believing in a life after death. Tchiyat HaMetim can mean some kind of period of Geula when the whole, when, when uh, um, the dead will return to life. Uh, it's not clear that there, there are only There are two places in Tanakh which talk about Tchiyat I'll just finish this sentence and then, I'll, 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 and then we'll hear you. There are only two places in Tanakh which relate to Tchiyat HaMitim. One is at the end of Sefer Daniel, uh, and the other is the vision of the Valley of Dry Bones of Yechezka. And Sarah neither Joe, of them... Sarah Joe. Ah. <laughs> Uh, let's uh, move forward with this. No, why can't I? Why can't I change? Move to the next slide. Okay, we've looked at that one. We've looked at Mishnah Sanhedrin. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so, three things which are supposed to be, which Mishnah Sanhedrin as, presents as Ikarei Emuna, as, uh, as things that a Jew has to believe. And it's not necessarily um, 
מובן מאליו, because Judaism, because, because Torah is all about doing things as opposed to believing things. When, well, when is the, when is the, the, the Mishnah is the first place that we have a suggestion that there are things you have to believe in order to be Jewish, in order to be part of Am Yisrael, in order to have a chelek le'olam haba. And it could well be that those, uh, um, that idea of believing things, it's very interesting that it appears only at the same, uh, at the same time as Judaism, Jews and Christians are um, uh, struggling with each other, the allegiance of the pagan world, the Roman world. At the time of the, the, time of the, the end of the Second Temple and this, this period just after that is the beginning of Christianity. And at the same time as Christianity begins, there's a tremendous, an enormous fashion in the Roman Empire for, um, for Yadut. Many people begin to be, we talked about this last week, when we, last week, two weeks ago, when we talked about Helene Amarka, uh, that uh, this, uh, uh, this uh, fad for, for adopting Jewish customs, um, attaching oneself to, a Jewish, to Jewish communities is a, a very strong trend throughout the Roman world. Um, and it's very interesting that the big difference between Christianity and Judaism is Christianity says you don't have to do anything. You just have to believe. And that at the same time that Christianity is saying that and saying these are the things you have to believe in. Uh, we have the first example of a, uh, um, a Mishnah, a, Mishnah a, a, a Jewish teaching which says there are things you have to believe to be part of the Jewish people. Uh, and that trend, you know, it starts from here and it just, and it goes on. Where do we see, where's the most famous example? The most famous example is in the Rambam, who takes the, these uh, Ikarei Muna and uh, um, uh, fleshes them out. Uh, I'm going to jump again. Okay, so in the so in uh, the Rambam's Maimonides, written in the in the uh, in the twelfth century, um, in his explanation of the Mishnah on the Peric and the Mishnah that we just the, which includes the Mishnah that we just read. He has an introduction to, uh, to that chapter in the Mishnah. It's called Hakdama um, Leperek Chelek, which is the eighth chapter of Masechet Sanhedrin. And it begins with this Mishnah, Kol Yisrael Yesh Lehem Chelek Leolam Abba, and that's why it's called Perek Chelek. It's, very, very, it's a very, very famous um, uh, introduction by the, of the Rambam. Um, and it includes what's become famous as the 13 principles, mm -hmm. the last part of this, of this introduction. What I've put on your screen here is the eighth of the 13th principle, the idea that exactly what Moshe says in our, in our parsha, that Torah is God's word revealed from heaven. That we should believe that all this Torah which is in our hands, now that's very interesting. What does the Rambam mean? Or, or that's not clear. What does the Rambam mean by kol ha-Torah hazot? Is that Torah uh, shebikhtav? Is it 
חמישה חומשי תורה, איזה חמישה חומשי תורה, אנד הנביאים, אנד הכתובים, איזה תורה שבכתב, אנד תורה שבעל פה. כלומר, And what are we supposed to believe about, about that? Shehigia elav kulam et Hashem yitbarach. All of it was revealed to Moshe by God, be'inyan shenikra al derech hash'ala dibur. In a way which we call al derech hash'ala, because we have no better way of describing it. And by borrowing a term from human ex- existence and human experience, dibur. So the Rambam is already saying, saying, don't think that God really spoke to Moshe, because God doesn't have a mouth, and, uh, and, can his, and can his word really be heard like words? But we call it dibul, some other method, some method of transmission, which we can only describe as speech. And in truth, we don't know exactly how it came to Moshe. The only one who can really know how he experienced the world of, word of God is Moshe, because his, his Nebuah is different to any other experience of God's presence that anybody else, any other living being ever had. And we should have to believe that Moshe was like a scribe, Shekor Imlo, והוא כותב כל מאורעות הימים, והסיפורים, והמצוות. So how should we visualize what happened between God and Moshe? We should visualize it that Moshe was like a scribe. God read to him, read out to him, spoke to him, all the events described in the Torah, all the stories in the Torah, and all the commandments in the Torah. ולפיכך נקרא מחוקק. And that's why Moshe is called the legislator. The en hefresh, and there's no difference between what you believe about how these psukim were, were, were transmitted between uvnei cham, kushu mitzrayim, ufut uchna'an, a very simple, plain, genealogical verse from Sefer Bereshit, like the children of cham were kush, and Mitzrayim, and Fut, and Kna'an, or V'shem Ishto Mehi Tzaval Bat Matred, or the name of a, uh, the wife of, I think it's uh, um, uh, one, the wife, one of the wives of Esav, or one of his, his children, was Mehi Tzaval, the daughter of Matred, or of a loaded pasuk like Ani Ani Anochi Hashem or Shema Yisrael Hashem Elokeinu Hashem Echad. Ki hakol mipi hagvura vhakol Torat Hashem Tmima Tehora Ukdosha Emet. So we're to believe that every word in well, looking at the examples that the Rambam has brought, he's only brought he's taken. But he's very carefully brought an example from the beginning of Bereshit, from the end of Bereshit, and from Sefer Dvarim, as if to say, don't think that the book which is transmitted as Divrei Moshe, as the words of Moshe which he spoke in Midbar, um, in uh, Arvot Moab, on the plains of Moab before his death and the, and the people crossing over into Eretz Israel, don't think that the words of that book, of Moshe's words, are any different to anywhere, any other part of the Torah. All of it, mipi ha all of it is the word of God. But what about the rest of the Tanakh? And what about the uh, uh, Torah Shabal Peh? So if we carry on looking in the next, the next uh, section of, the next paragraph of this Yesod Shmini of Ikarei Amuna, which I think I have not put here, so I'm going to change new share. I'm going to change from the PowerPoint to our, to our source sheet. Wow, and that was so smooth. The Zuba, Zoom are improving the whole time. Um, 
look at the th on, the, on the third paragraph down. Ela kol dibur bedibur min ha-Torah. Um, sorry, the last paragraph. Uchmochen perush ha-Torah ha-Mukubar. Just as the written Torah is from God, uchmochen perush ha-Torah ha-Mukubar. The explanations and interpretations of the what's to ha Torah ha mekubal, the received gam ken mipi ha gvura, the Torah which perush ha Torah ha mekubal, the accepted interpretations of the Torah. What does that mean? Accepted interpretations of the Torah. What we understand is Torah shabal pe. So uh, so it, when the Rambam says perush ha Torah ha mekubal. He means the Torah Shabal Peh, which has been written down. In other words, the Mishnah and the Gemara, the Talmud. And this is already very, very uh, uh, fuzzy and difficult. Because just as it, as the, uh, as, as Sefer Dvarim is presented to us as Divrei Moshe, uh, the Mishnah and the Gemara are presented to us as, as Divrei Chachamim. And yet, we're supposed to understand that when God communicated the Torah to Moshe, all the interpretations ever, uh, ever uh, spoken by any of the Chachamim and included in Torah Shabal Peh, were communicated in that same moment. The way that we carry out mitzvot, like sukkah and lulav and shofar and tzitzit and tefillin, and the Rambam has specifically chosen here mitzvot, which we are not told the details of how to perform them in the Torah, right? When it says, live in Sukkot for, in, for, 12, for seven days, it doesn't tell us that the Sukkot, what the roof of the Sukkot has to look like, how big it has to be, how high it has to be, or any of those details. When it says, of the Kapot Marim, we don't know whether a Lulav is supposed to be the closed branch of a palm tree or the open branch of a palm tree. I think about how different that is. That's the difference between Palm Sunday and pilgrims waving open palm branches and the lulavim, which, don't, uh, which allow people to crowd together in the shul uh, and walk around the bima. And how do we blow shofar? And what did tzitzit look like? And what is, what is written in tefillin? None of those details are provided in Torah Shabbat, and the Rambam is saying, as we keep those laws today, so they were in his day in the in the twelfth century. So who be'atzmo ha'tavnit asher amar Hashem itbarach le'Moshe? That is what God said to Moshe. Vehu amar lanu, and Moshe said to us, Vehu ha'Moser. And it was Moshe who gave it to, who gave it to us. Vehu ha-megia ha-moser ne'eman b'shlichuto. Vehaamamar ha-more al ha-yesod ha-shmini hazeh. And how do we know this idea that Torah is min ha-shamayim? Hu ma she ne'emar, that we know it from what the verse in Sefer Bamidbar, Perek Tetzayin, Pasuk Kafchet, which Moshe said to Korach, Bezot tedeun ki Hashem shelachani laasot et kol hamaasim ha'ele ki lo milibi. This, the, the judgment of Korach, is how you'll know that God sent me to perform all these, uh, all these acts and I didn't make it all up. It's not my, cre my creation. So the Rambam brings the story of Korach as the source for belief in Torah Minashamayim.
let's look for a li for a, for a minute at where this at uh, the Rambam nuancing this very clear dogmatic statement of what we have to believe. Like this is a very all encompassing statement of what we have to believe. Come back to our PowerPoint. Sure. And let's go up one slide. Okay. In the Moren of Uchim, the Rambam says, again, it's the same Rambam, but it's just a different book. And this is not present, not, not, this is not dogmatic. This is Rambam's, Moren Nebuchim is Rambam speaking to people who are confused and doubtful about what they should be believing. Uh, and this is in the second part of Moren Nebuchim near the end. Vida, ki lechol navi, right, this is the Rambam talking about the, the Sifre Nevi'im, the words of Torah Shebikhtav, the Tanakh, but not Hamisha Chumshei Torah, the Nevi'im afterwards, from Yoshua, uh, although we say that Sefer Yoshua and Shoftim were both written by, were both written by Shmuel on the basis of a Gemara in, uh, um, Masechet Makot, if I remember, if I recall correctly. Da ki lechol navi, davar miyuch, echad miyuchad bo. Ki ilu hu lashon ha'ishahu. Every navi has his own unique style. As if it was that person speaking. Every Navi, although he hears something from a divine source, when he comes to communicate it, he communicates it in his own voice, with his own tongue and in his own style and in this in this context the Rambam goes on to talk about the Nebuah of Yishayahu and how it's full of metaphor and simile and how difficult it is to understand he talks about the Nebuah of Yechezkel and how can he have a, a, a vision of of God on his throne when certainly according to the Rambam, God has, it's very important to believe that God has no body, no head, no arms, no physical, no physical, uh, no physical being. And he goes on to talk about, uh, in a much more nuanced way, about Divrei Hanavi'im. Um, and this is already much less dogmatic than what we've seen in the way the Rambam wrote in Perek Chelek in Ikareya in the in the 13 principles of faith. So do we know what happened? Do we know what we're supposed to believe? Is there something that we're supposed to believe? Or is it much, is it more much healthier and much more uh, a part of Jewish, to, authentic Jewish tradition to just look at what a person does and not look inside their head. How do we know what a person is thinking? How do we know what a person believes and what relevance does that have to between one people and a, be, be, between individuals? It's Christianity which uh, burns people at the stake for what they do and don't believe. Where does this idea of, of uh, 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 having to believe certain things come from? How did it? How it, how authentic is it to yeah, to to uh, the Jewish people? And more than that, has the text of the Torah of the have the, has the text of the um, Tanakh always been the same? 
So there is a, a, a big um, uh, discussion going on right now because the, uh, there's a, a, a project's just been publicized by the Israel Antiquities Authority and Tel Aviv University and a, 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 a university in Sweden because they've done an analysis of the, uh, um, the parchments of, on which the Megillot, Megillot Yama Melech, the Dead Sea Scrolls were written. And it's brought them to all kinds of uh, new conclusions, uh, which is making, making them reconsider what everybody had always thought about many of the, of the Megillot. Um, why am I connecting this? Because the question of what the text of the Torah has always looked like has been based on um, the, on the uh, fact that Sifrei Torah, generally speaking, all look the same within, uh, within Jewish tradition. Okay, so I, I, what I thought I would put, on, uh, put in front of us is different examples of uh, um, what people saw as the authentic text of the Torah. So in this, if we start from the time of the Rambam, um, here we go, uh, he was familiar with this book, which is the, which is, uh, which we call the Aleppo Codex, which today is in, um, in the Israel Museum. And when people wanted to check their Sifrei Torah, that they were collect correctly written, because every Sefer Torah is copied from another Sefer Torah, uh, or, co or copied from what we call Nusach HaMesorah, the traditionally accepted version of the Torah. Uh, and the text, which was in the time of the Rambam, considered a, uh, a very reliable text was this uh, um, codex, this copy of the Tanakh, not just the Torah, just the, the whole Tanakh, from Aram Tzova in Syria, which dates from uh, just before the Rambam, the century before the Rambam. Uh, and it was considered, this was the standard by which people checked every sefer, their Sifrei Torah. And if there was a, a, a discrepancy between the Sefer Torah and the Aleppo Codex, in, certainly in Syria, then uh, um, you'd correct the Sefer Torah according to Nusach HaMesara as it appeared in, the, in, in, in this Codex. Um, why were people so excited about the Dead Sea Scrolls? Because in the uh, in the library of Qumran, which was found in, which was discovered in 1951. I'm going to skip this. Uh, in, uh, in the, in, in the north, north of Yamamelach, in this cave that you can see in the center here, which was the library, the repository of uh, a community who separated themselves from all the rest of the community of the, of, they were uh, um, self-imposed exiles, isolationists from the rest of the Jewish people uh, in the time of the, in the second temple period from some time around the period of the, the Hasmoneans until the Khurban. And what was found in this cave was, it seems to have been, we'll see this cave, this cave, which is called cave number 11, 
Um, this seems to have been the library where people, there was, they found ink and they found uh, parchment, as well as uh, and this a very large collection of containers, which look like this. Right, this is a, a dead. This is a container, a, an earthenware container with a lid, discovered by Professor Yigal Yadin, and he's looking at it here. Um, it's actually it was just the the uh, first archaeologist, Israeli archaeologist, to uh, um, become aware of the Dead Sea Scrolls was his was Yigal Yadin's father, Eliezer Sukenik. Um, this is Yadin, who devoted his life to investigating the scrolls. Uh, with one of the containers. They found part of every single book of the Tanakh in this cave in Qumran, which first of all was, uh, um, was like a, a gift to Medina, the new Medinat Yisrael, saying your whole heritage, the Tanakh on the basis of which you uh, um, you were inspired to come back to Eretz Israel and create this state is right here. But in addition to the, 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 all the books of the, of the Tanakh, uh, there is also a, a very large number of other books in this library of, in Qumran. Um, some of them are the, clearly the rule books and the personal literature of the Dead Sea sect. Um, this, the uh, um, Mizmorim that they, the text of Mizmorim that they said, like almost almost a sidur of the of the of the sect. Uh, the uh, rule book by which they lived, I, um, but also a. Uh, many books which are not included in our Tanakh, what we call Sfarim Chitzonim, many of which we've never had the complete version, we've we, the complete Hebrew version has never survived until today. Uh, and we only have a text, text based on the Greek version of, these, of many of these books. And they were not, one of the reasons that they haven't, weren't preserved is they weren't included in what Chazal defined as the Tanakh. Okay, so one of the things that uh, uh, the most exciting find in Qumran was the, what's called the Isaiah scroll, the only example of a book of Tanakh which they found in its entirety in the, in the Qumran collection was Sefer Yishayal, which again is very exciting and very interesting, partly because, uh, again, biblical critics look at Sefer Yishayal and say, this was written in two different periods, it's two different books. And to find uh, the whole book together, dating from the, from, from the second century BCE, although it's a, a, a long time, a few, a few hundred years after Yishayal, it's still a very exciting testimony to the fact that this doesn't, nobody seems to have conceived of it as two books, certainly by that time. Um, this is an example of what these scrolls looked like when they first found them. And you can see how difficult it is to A, unravel them because they're, they're, uh, they were preserved, rolled up. And the question was, how do you unroll them without destroying the text inside. Um, and uh, that's been a very, very long process. And only today, uh, in the last few years with infrared imaging, has many of the texts been, have, have, have we've been able to read many of the texts which were previously basically ineligible. Um, this is a sec section from Sefer Yirmiyaw. <laughs> Connections that all the fuss is being made about today. Why? Because uh, the, ex the uh, um, investigation that they did now, as I said, was to take tiny, tiny particles from the backs of these parchments, 
like a fragment like this and analyze the DNA of within because parchment is made of animal skin so it has DNA um, and one of the things that they found was that this fragment of Sefer Yomiyao was written on cow skin parchment made from a cow and another section of Sefer Yomiyao was also written on cow skin these are not the only copies of Sefer Yomiyao in the Qumran collection but the fact that two of them are written on cow skin made uh, uh, today's archaeologists gave them the answer to a question which they've been wondering about for a long time. What was that question? All the texts of the Dead Sea Scrolls, which are in Qumran, do they represent the library of Kat Midbar Yehuda, of these uh, very... Um, uh, ultra orthodox, right? I would say ultra ultra orthodox, um, uh, very uh, um, very extreme, very uh, um, uh, different to the rest of what we know about Jews in Baichi. Does it represent their library, or is it a collection of books brought from by people at the time when uh, the whole community of Eretz Yisrael was in danger, when many people found refuge in Midbar Yehuda, and in that case people coming from many other parts of Eretz Yisrael may have added books, their scrolls, to the collection of the, that was uh, hidden uh, in, the, um, in this cave in Qumran. And because most of the, all the scrolls, which are um, the books of Kat Midbar Yehuda, are written on sheepskin, on parchment made from sheep, and sheep can exist in Midbar Yehuda, sheep and goats, right? Um, the fact that oh. these were written on cow skin makes the, uh, makes the archaeologists think that they weren't written in Midbar Yehuda, they were written somewhere else in Eretz Israel, where cows have pasture um, and where cows it would be much more likely for a cow's skin to be used for the uh, raw material, the part of the parchment on which a Sefer Torah would be written. And that would mean that these, this scroll came from somewhere else outside of Qumran. And the conclusion is that that means that the, the scrolls found in Qumran don't represent only what uh, um, books which were used by and, uh, and uh, were important to the cut, but to represent the community in Eretz Israel, the Jewish people in Eretz Israel at the time of the, the, to, the end of the Second Temple period from all over the place. Okay, one of the, uh, um, the reasons that people were interested in this was that the, as opposed to Sefer Yishayahu, which is very similar to the text of Sefer Yishayahu that is included in our standard Tanakhim, which we call Nusach HaMesora, this text of Sefer Yirmiyahu was slightly different. These like, it's not the whole book, it's just a couple of fragments. The differences are, um, are, are differences of, of, of words. They don't change the meaning of the text. Um, but it makes it, the archeologists would like to say on the basis of this, look, the text of the Tanakh is not a fixed text. It has changed over the, it, it, there, there were slight differences in the text at the time of, uh, of the end of Bayit Sheni. And there must have existed a number of different texts and Nusach HaMesora is just, our traditional text is just one of them. They all mean the same, but there are very slight variations in words. And they would like to, they would like to say, well, maybe that means that it's not quite true to say that the text of 
all of the received Tanakh, Torah Shebikhtav, has always been the same. And people are getting very excited about this right now, but what they haven't noticed is that uh, the examples, most of the, all the, the examples that they're, they're looking at are examples from Sifrei Nevi'im, which even the Rambam says, Nevi'im speak in their own language, not in the, not necessarily in the language of, not, in, it, they communicate in their own words, not in the words of God. Um, I can see that I'm going to, I'm running into Bracha's time. And Elisa's going to have to leave us. Yeah? Um, so the first thing that I wanted to point out is very possibly there is a difference between the accuracy of of books of the Tanakh, which are Sifrei Nebi'im and Ketuvim, and the, uh, and Chamisha Chumshei Torah, in which there are basically, and this is the last thing on, 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 our, on our PowerPoint for today, I think. Where did I put it? Um, is that there are basically three examples, three different versions of the Torah which appear in um, in Qumran. What call and most of them are Nusach Surah, the same text that we have today. The uh, the versions of the of the of Chamisha Chumshei Torah, which are most similar to the literature, the book, the other books belonging to Kat Midbar Yehuda, are very similar to the texts, uh, the text used by the Shomronim, which is different to our Sifrei Torah. And that makes people think, begin to think that maybe there's a connection between the community in Kat Midbar Yehuda and the surviving community of the Shomronim today. Interesting. And the, uh, uh, the third is a, a, a version of the Chamisha Chumshei Torah, which is very similar to the way it appears in Targum Ashivim, right? The Greek translation of the of the of, of the Tanakh which dates from uh, about the the same uh, maybe a century before Katmid Bar Yehuda from uh, Alexandria and whether it was written as the Talmud tells us by Ptolemy the third for his library in Alexandria or whether it was written for the extremely large Jewish community in Alexandria um, but it is clearly has uh, in that Greek translation, uh, there are um, changes from what we, we know as Nusach Hamsara and the, and the, and the Chazal describe those changes as being, in, uh, being changes made on purpose. What's the word for on purpose? Uh, changes made intentionally in order to prevent people unfamiliar with Jewish tradition from misinterpreting when they read the Greek translation of the Torah. Um, in the same way, the Shomroni, uh, the Samaritan version of the Torah, fits with their uh, understanding of the... Uh, um, the history of Am Yisrael and who they are. Uh, I'm, I can't think of examples off the cuff now, um, but it, it, it makes sense. And I, you could say that I'm being, um, uh, I'm discriminate, discriminating in our favor here. It makes sense that there is a reason for changes to have come in, harmonizing changes to have come into the Hebrew version of Targum Shivim. Which is an inter which is an interpretation already, um, and the uh, the Samaritan version of the Torah, as opposed to what we call Nusach Hamisora. 
Um, where did I want to end up with all of this? Uh, um, discussion from the Rambam uh, through Megillot Qumran and the, the newest analysis. Um, I wanted to come, come to a place where we can say people discuss that there might have been changes in the text of Torah Torah Shabbal Peh, uh, in the, uh, uh, in, even in the text of the Nabi'im and the Ketuvim, that doesn't necessarily mean that there have been changes in the text of Torah, of, of Torah Moshe. Uh, and maybe um, and there are those who would say I'm being defensive here. Um, but there is clearly one of the uh, um, conclusions that we can draw from the latest discoveries is that there is a difference between Torah Moshe and the rest of the Tanakh, just as there's a difference between Torah Shabal Peh, and in which we really don't worry about what, uh, what words, in what words did, com did, did God communicate the interpretations of Torah Shabbat to, Mo to Moshe? Because it doesn't really matter, because we rewrite Torah Shabbat Peh all the time. That's the reason that it's Torah Shabbat Peh. Um, and to me, it's important that these uh, um, changes are not so, not clear in anything like the same way in the text of Chamisha Chumshei Torah, Torah Shebikhtav, as they are in the book, later books of the Tanakh and in, uh, um, and in, uh, well, we don't have text for the, the for, for Torah Shabal Peh. Um, we don't have ancient texts for Torah Shabal Peh. Um, I think that it's only fair to open this up to questions because I'm being, I've been going on um, controversial ground. Uh, so, uh, so let's see what you have to say and if there's anything which needs clarification. And again, I'm really sorry for the, for all the, all for being late, for the technical problems, for the, uh, um, uh, the quality of the, of the, uh, uh, of my Zoom uh, and all the problems that we've had today. And I am very lucky, very happy that it's only happened on our last Zoom, uh, uh, Zoom share and not in any of the previous ones. Okay, so now I'm unmuting everybody. Uh, you know what, Aliza, can you un unmute everybody? Yes, sure, I'll unmute everyone. This would, uh, uh, everyone has the ability to unmute themselves if they'd like to say something. So um, that's set up for them. And, uh, and we have a couple of minutes uh, if somebody wants a question before we um, show our video about the campaign. I want to thank Sarah Jo for the great sharing for this, uh, this uh, season, the whole year it was uh, challenging. And uh, don't feel bad about your internet connection because it's all not in your hands. And uh, I thoroughly enjoyed everything of it, even though <laughs> Sometimes it was up and down, <laughs> but the connection, what, what can you do? The connection is uh, out of our hands, but uh, no, it was good, the whole question. Okay. And, uh, it's when very true that the connection, when we come to the Torah, the connection is in very truth out of our hands. Okay. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> exactly, exactly, but uh, everything was good. Anybody else? Okay, I'm just going to share it now a minute. Um, so, uh, so this is our last year. Uh, I want to just before you, sh you, you share the um, uh, video with the, the clip with Panina, uh, I just want to uh, invite everybody um, next year. Our plan is... That I told I'll them all about it. I gave all the details yeah, of okay. next year's year. Okay, <laughs> before you came, I'm going to share a video today from Mindy. Here we right, go. Great.
Greetings. In the beginning, Hashem created COVID. Okay, it's a Makam Mahalechet, which is mentioned in uh, Mishnah Ta'anit. And that's uh, pretty scary. I wouldn't read that Mishnah if I were you. But during this beginning, I was wondering about where all the shiurim going to be. I'm going to miss all my shiurim. And there was this weekly shiur that I wanted, and that sh weekly shiur that I wanted. And then there were the special events, and I was like, what's going to be with the Magid before Pesach? What's going to be with our Yom HaShoah program? And I, these are things that I had been doing for years and years and years. And lo and behold, Hashem had pity on us and created Zoom and gave us the know-how to put it into practice. <laughs> Friends, learning is an integral part of our lives. And the Women's Beit Midrash came through for us, just like our amazing local Moetza. Okay? Im ein Kemach, ein Torah. And Baruch Hashem, we have had both and we will have both. So for the purpose of this fundraising campaign, I want to call it our Nona for the Torah. Together, let's strengthen the Women's Beit Midrash so we can continue to teach, to reach out to our community, Zooming or otherwise. We need 100% participation. Any donation is a mitzvah, and it goes towards learning Torah and strengthening our community. We've seen that that is a really wonderful thing. So please feel free to call me and discuss the various sums and opportunities for helping to spread Torah. Thank you. Okay. Okay. And I'm, um, Mindy is very happy. Together. Mindy's very happy for anyone to contact her. She asked me to send everyone her email address as well. Uh, and you can certainly reach out to her um, if you have any questions about uh, donating. Um, and you can uh, donate on the Women's Baby Drash website. Okay, wbm.org.il. It's very clear there how you can give credit cards, checks, um, whatever works for you. Okay, thank you very much, Alisa, for the good work you did. Yeah, Alisa, thank you. You've been amazing all the way through this. Absolutely amazing. My pleasure.